Good afternoon. My name is Richard McGregor. I'm the Senior Fellow for East Asia at the Lowy Institute. Well, some have branded it a khaki election, but the May 21 poll might look much like that after recent news on inflation and interest rates and the focus on cost of living issues. But still, the election is being held at a time of tremendous ferment in foreign and defence policy. The debate is largely driven by the rise of China, a putative superpower to rival the United States, and the virtual collapse of Sino-Australian relations. Now, the contents of that debate are by now pretty familiar. Years of tense diplomatic exchanges with Beijing, followed by a series of punitive trade measures taken by China against a range of Australian exports. In this campaign, the coalition government has questioned the ability of the Labor Party to manage relations with China and its commitment to higher defence spending. Labor, in turn, has returned fire over the recent China Solomon's Island deal on national security uh, in the Pacific. But for all the noise, do national security issues sway votes in Australia and in what circumstances? And how do voters see the relative strengths of the party on defence and foreign policy. To discuss these issues, I'm joined by a stellar panel, Brian Lochnane, former federal director of the Liberal Party for 13 years from 2003. He's one of Australia's most experienced political campaigners. He's also deputy chairman of the International Democratic Union and Alliance of Centre-Right Political Parties. Tony Mitchell Moore is the founder of Visibility, a leading strategic communications firm and a veteran of 12 state and federal elections. He's advised both sides of the house on research and communications. And Dr. Rebecca Huntley is one of Australia's foremost researchers on social trends. She led research at Essential Media and Vox Populi and was a director at Ipsos Australia. She's also on the board of the New South Wales, New South Wales branch of the Labor Party. Brian, let's start with you. You've run four federal election campaigns for the Liberal Party. Um, in your experience, do national security issues rate consistently in voters' minds, or do they vary depending on the circumstances? And is it true, as is often asserted, that co conservatives, the coalition, have a natural advantage on this issue? Well, uh, it's great to be part of this panel, Richard, and um, hello to everyone. Um, well, each election is different and the settings that drive each election is different. There's no doubt at all that in the 2001 election, which occurred uh, not long after 9-11, that um, uh, national security uh, absolutely helped to frame the whole context of the election and added a seriousness to the election. Other elections uh, have been different, different issues have dominated at different times, depending what's happened. In my view, in the current election, um, clearly cost of living is the major issue. Um, I think also an underappreciated issue at the moment is um, still COVID, the lag of COVID. A lot of people have been impacted on by COVID over the last month or so, staff shortages, things shut down and whatnot. Um, in my view, um, national security isn't driving uh, this election um, as a major issue. But I do think it's very important in the impact it's having on the context of the election. It's clear that we're in serious times. Uh, events in Ukraine, events in our part of the world, uh, helping, I think, to add an element of seriousness to the context of the election. That's different to, um, as you were saying, to driving the vote. So if you look at it in a straight you know, bottom line political sense, um, is in my experience is national security um, usually one of the key drivers of the vote. No, I don't think it's it's usually 9-11 uh, put to one side, a key driver of the vote, but it's, it's very, very important or can be very important in helping set the context of the election. Um, I think uh, it's, you know, clearly, I think for time immemorial um, polling has suggested that the coalition um, is respected on economic management and national security. The Labor Party has other areas on which it um, has strengths. So I think national security uh, over time has been a, a strength for, um, for 
um, for the coalition. It, the, what national security is changes election to election. On some occasions, it's border security. Other cases, uh, other times, it could be um, more strictly defence related or foreign affairs related. Um, but um, um, uh, I, it, 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 on balance, I think, has been an, an advantage for the coalition. And in this uh, current election, Brian, sticking with you for a second, you see if there were any big issues about national security, obviously China has loomed large in the debate in recent years. Lots of polling has shown that uh, Australians' view of China has uh, diminished. We see them more as a threat and less as an economic partner. That has not, um, that is not a sort of, to use a pollster's word, salient issue comparable to cost of living in COVID in, uh, in your observation so far. Well, I think it's, um, it's, um, it shouldn't be underestimated as an issue. And it's got the potential to emerge very quickly as an issue. One of the things about national security is, um, as um, the, uh, the Brits say, events, dear boy, events. Um, the proverbial something um, could occur, you know, tomorrow, and completely change the last two weeks of this campaign. Um, now, assuming that doesn't happen, then um, it's um, it's less of an issue. Um, than compared to, say, cost of living. Okay, Tony, let me go to you. Um, the, as I mentioned at the start, you know, uh, a, a number of people have called this a, a car key election. In other words, one that turns on defence and diplomatic issues. Uh, and when the Ukraine-Russia conflict broke out, or I should say when Russia invaded Ukraine more accurately, uh, you know, this was going to be, you know, another thing that was perhaps going to transform the electoral uh, landscape to a significant extent. Um, according to the feedback that you're getting for your, from your focus groups and the like, uh, it, has that been the case? No, not at all. It's not a car key election at all. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. People have picked up on, definitely picked up on Ukraine. And when that first happened, people were expressing concern to us. They thought it's a terrible thing. Similarly, in the last couple of weeks, they've picked up on China and can, so the awareness of it is okay. But in terms of it framing the election or being an issue that um, is gonna sway their vote one way or another, it just, it's just not rating. Um, the economy, cost of living is huge. If you wanna bring a focus group to life, bring up cost of living at the moment. Um, the leaders, there's a degree to which this is a presidential sort of campaign and they're thinking very much about the leaders. Uh, COVID, I agree with Brian on that and performance on COVID being rated on that. Even things like childcare and aged care um, come up much more strongly than, than um, national security. Um, there is a natural advantage, a natural kind of brand advantage for the coalition uh, on that issue but it's just not rating, it's just not capturing the imagination of, of swinging voters at, at the moment. Um, very much their concerns at the moment are kind of inside the, the bubble of their own lives. Um, and so directly it's not um, affecting um, the way they're thinking about voting. Now, indirectly, you could argue that it, that it, that it is in a, in, a, in a smaller way. Um, certainly that narrative that the, the coalition are trying to to run for re-election uh, has some saliency. So the idea that we've been through really tough times, unprecedented times, that the future is really uncertain, and so stick with stick with what you know and stick with you know the stronger option, and rather than le taking a leap of faith to an un unknown proposition. Well, certainly um, Ukraine and um, Solomon's help feed into that that story about future uncertainty. So. At a lower level, yes, you could argue that it's helping, you know, that narrative and that narrative, you know, has some currency with, with swinging voters, but directly, no, and certainly I wouldn't characterise it as a car key election. So, uh, Tony, to sum up what you said, it certainly frames and seeds the uncertainty that many people are feeling, but it's not decisive in the ballot box. Exactly. I mean, the future's uncertain in lots of different ways, you know, COVID, the economy, um, and, and this is just one, the Ukraine and Solomon's being the latest issues, um, 
just feed into that into that in a in a similar way, but perhaps even a, a lesser way than some of those other issues. Rebecca, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, later, I think, about uh, all, you know, broader issues of national security like climate change. But when we were speaking before, you were talking um, uh, about a similar phenomenon, about peoples having, you know, sort of withdrawing into themselves in many respects, rather than looking out into the world and, and sort of thinking about their vote in that respect. Uh, so how, how, do, how do you view the, in that frame the national security issues in the current election? Yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating over the kind of two years of COVID um, and in some ways um, also uh, intensified by fire and flood is that is that people have been turning much more to their local communities and their state government for the usual kind of um, sense of safety and security and way forward. Um, and uh, so in a sense, while there's been some real frustration at the federal government, They've been seeing the federal government as less and less active or less and less relevant to making their lives um, better. And I think that there's something about when you lock people down to five kilometres or 15 kilometres, suddenly the local becomes very, very important. And obviously we've seen um, that play itself out politically in state premiers becoming, uh, you know, um, national figures in so many ways. And in most elections, except for the last election in South Australia, returned um, with uh, with majorities, you know, regardless of their uh, approach to COVID. So I think that we've had a turning inward um, in many ways. And one of the implications of that has been um, issues like immigration, which come up consistently in focus groups uh, as as a kind of issue that, that feeds their, let's say, economic anxiety is something that's kind of moved away. I and mean, it's flipped a bit when you can't, you can't talk to a, um, somebody working in the service industry or small business who don't say the fact that they can't get staff being, you know, a huge problem um, uh, multiplied by the fact that their staff have to kind of uh, socially isolate because COVID is still around. So we've got had a bit of a turning inward. That doesn't mean that national security doesn't provide a really significant backdrop to what both Tony and Brian were talking about, which is a general, I would, you know, vibe of an election. Which is that? Which is that for most Australian voters, this idea that we'll return to some kind of normal life where there isn't, um, where there aren't kind of plagues and flood and fire, and we haven't got um, America uh, struggling um, in so many ways, and we haven't got the ascendancy of China. So this kind of, and and where you can actually have a war in Europe, that kind of sense that we we we're not going to return to normal. That there's a kind of new um, there are new parameters, both domestically and globally, we have to come to terms with, um, really do freak people out. <laughs> what they do with those levels of anxiety or concern or what is the future, um, uh, what they actually do with that when they've got an opportunity to express that at a federal level um, is yet to be seen. Um, on China, I think, Look, I've been a researcher now for nearly 20 years and I've been listening to growing anxieties about China as an economic power, but increasingly as a political power. And for most Australians, not necessarily as a um, ideal alternative to the United States as a global leader. And that kind of exists. It kind of gets raised. It kind of gets talked about. It can occasionally be weaponised by groups like the United um, Australia Party or One Nation. Um, again, I haven't really worked out from the quality of research I do whether voters think that um, a conservative government is necessarily better positioned to deal with China than a Labor government. They just think that any Australian government is going to be a very, a pretty much a weak voice against China given its, its power, given its, um, uh, given its trajectory. Um Brian, to, to continue on that theme, um, certainly my uh, impression as an amateur observer of the election is that the Labor Party hasn't really wanted to talk about China uh, and maybe broadly foreign policy. Uh, in fact, they've stayed in alignment with the government. Of course, that changed when the Solomons deal happened and they used that to uh, attack the government. But I'm kind of wondering why something as dramatic as the rise of China at the moment um, has not been able to puncture, uh, you know, or, or cut through 
um, uh, as, as a major issue. I mean, Peter Dutton, whether you like him or not, is an effective political communicator and has been talking about this issue a lot um, uh, in the media and on talkback radio. So, so why do you think it is not cutting through? Um, well, I think I disagree a bit with that. Um, there's a difference between cutting through and being in something of concern and something that is in this election moving votes. So I think, the, the, as I think the other two speakers have also touched on, I think there's no doubt at all that uh, we're seeing uh, in recent years increasing concern. And I think that concern is there. Um, if the proverbial something did happen in our region in the next two weeks, it could you know, very, very quickly become um, a dominant issue. But um, is it what um, people themselves are concerned about going into the ballot box at the moment? Um, uh, as both Tony and Rebecca have touched on, it's not, uh, as much as um, cost of living and, and some other issues. But that shouldn't take away from the fact that it is a matter of, of concern to people. Um, but it's just not the the vote, made, vote motivator that some other issues are. So, Tony, then, over time, uh, some people have been talking for a while about the new normal um, in Australian life. It might even apply across many countries uh, globally, particularly uh, democracies. Certainly in relations with China, there's a, a new normal, which is a more fractious and difficult uh, relationship with China. Um, uh, in, in what sense do you see that uh, pervading but beyond the cost of living and the like pervading discussion in your focus groups and has it become changed or become much more intense in the last uh, four or five years yeah our work would mirror mirror what Re Rebecca said that the threat is there there's an underlying sense of threat about that that um, politically um, you know it's an authoritarian state People talk in focus groups about you know um, how the there's no freedom of press and um, websites are, are blocked. All of that kind of stuff. They're they're aware of all of that, and there's a just just also a sense that China is big and growing, um, and it, it is a challenge to the U.S. Um, so it's at that underlying level that threat is there, and and people can talk about that in focus groups. But just at the moment, you know that threat doesn't feel you know, imminent. It doesn't feel like it's, it's immediate. So it's not a 9-11 a, a sort of situation, or you could even talk about borders and Tampa, and, and people felt that very directly. People don't fe aren't feeling, you know, the China threat directly, even though they are aware of it. So unpack that a little bit for me. There's many parts of the China issue there. There's the issue of their political system. There's the issue of their sheer size. There's the issue of uh, it, their rivalry with the United States, a long-time ally and partner of Australia. Um, are, are they all sort of thrown in together or is there any particular part of that which is more, more important? Well, I think that you know, it's, a, it's a moving part sort of thing. They're all happening at the same time. China is rising where, where and they can see it as a credible threat now to, to the US, um, you know, economically, and, and as, as a power, as a world power. Whereas in the past, that wasn't the way the world worked. That's not the world that they, that they grew up with. Um, and, it's a di and China represents something different to them. You know, it represents a, 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 an authoritarian, what I was saying before, an authoritarian state where there's a lack of freedom, those sorts of things. People, can, a few people in groups can talk about Hong Kong and what's happened there. So there's that fear of aggression. Um, uh, so it, 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 there's a whole lot of moving parts to it that, that, that they, they can probably talk to all of those sorts of things. Rebecca, you had something to say on that point? Yeah, I mean, I'm always interested when, uh, my fascination is when you, um, uh, is when people raise issues organically without you kind of probing. And I would say on China, the two issues that have come up, um, that often come up organically, other than it's, you know, economic size and, you know, China buying farmland, is the Darwin port. There's always like, we sold the Darwin port to the Chinese. That seems to um, um, exercise the anxiety of a particular kind of voter. But interestingly too, the whole issue of cyber security and, cyber, and um, the idea of Australia's uh, data somehow being um, 
uh, compromised by both both um, Russian, but also uh, the Chinese state. I mean, they tend to think that for Russia, it might not necessarily be, um, it might be kind of rogue actors in Russia, but they have a genuine anxiety. By they, I don't mean all Australians, but I mean the kinds of people that Tony and I have to spend a lot of time with in focus groups who are swinging voters who get their information from various places. So there are those two anxieties. And, you know, in a sense, over time, I've always felt that the the um, for many Australians, we're in a kind of forced in bargain with China, which is that there is a recognition that our economic uh, our economic well being um, and our need to um, have a good relationship with them. Nobody really wants to poke the bear or um, actually confront them directly. But there are these anxieties about what what are we going to get out of this um, exchange and how are we going to, um, how is our relationship, what is our relationship going to be about them, about with them over time? And interestingly, um, just to intersect with my particular interest, which is around climate change, one of the, um, and, and renewables, one of the great benefits for certain kinds of Australians around renewables is energy independence. Um, and this idea that we will create energy and we will um, potentially manufacture it more in Australia and become less reliant on China for our recycling, for our, um, for kind of our energy future. And that is a kind of interesting twist on, on these anxieties that um, are, are there about China. I was just, I, I think um, what's happening in the US is important in this whole thing and, and the unease that people people feel again at it. I don't want to overstate it. You know, it's not factoring into this election. It's when you probe and talk about it. And, and it. Um, I, I think there's always been a complacency that, you know, Australia will be okay because the US, if there was some imminent threat, the US would take care of it. But people's faith in the, in the US at the moment over the last few years, um, you know, it's, it's diminished and there's uncertainty about that. So you, that feeling of security because of the, the US alliance that they've had in the past is not necessarily there as strongly as it once was. I think that's an important point. Brian, do you, would you like to make a comment on that? Well, I think, um, I think that's, in, in my view, um, I, I agree. I agree with, um, with that comment. I think that... Um, the, the, the US was seen as the safe pair of hands to fall back, the ally that would come to our defence. I think that um, probably going back 10 years now, maybe a bit longer, um, the pivot to Asia that uh, was talked about didn't really manifest itself particularly strongly. And I, um, you know, there's a growing sense, I think, that perhaps the United States is not quite as strongly committed to the region um, as was the case in the past. What is interesting, though, is I think in recent times, recent times being the last six months or so, I think that has begun to change a bit. I think that um, there's you know, sufficient evidence from comments from Joe Biden about Taiwan and you know, that just the senior visits uh, to the region and now the Solomon Islands. I think that um, the, a sense of renewed engagement uh, and the um, development of, um, of the Quad, for example, um, is leading to people to think, well, perhaps the United States is committed and re fully re-engaged and committed to the, to the region. Yeah, I think that's uh, an important point. Certainly, I would think that uh, you might be right, Brian, about that changing. But until recently, I think China was a very predictable power. We knew what they wanted. Yes. Uh, as much as people didn't like it, the US was becoming more unpredictable. And that's a, 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 a sea change from a, a decade ago. Now, just back to China or Chinese Australians, it's often asserted, and a lot of um, things that are asserted by amateur election watchers must drive professionals like you all crazy at times. But, you know, if you look at uh, a couple of seats, for example, which are important in this election, Reed and Chisholm to take two, which have large Chinese Australian communities, and people are often asking me, is there, a, you know, how do the Chinese vote? And the Chinese community is actually very diverse, rich, poor, recently arrived, you know, been here for a long time. Many of them are, are Christians and the like. Um, so, you know, do Chinese vote in a certain way or according to certain issues or patterns? Now, Brian, you've actually been in the engine room uh, numerous times. Is there such a thing? Um, 
I see very little evidence to suggest that there is such a thing as a an organised block of, of of a vote by um, the Chinese community. In fact, there's very, unfortunately there's very few organised uh, blocks. If there were, it would make life a lot more, but simpler for um, for campaign directors. Um, I think there's what there is evidence is that um, the Chinese community, uh, not dissimilar dissimilar to the general community. For example, uh, they're diverse. Um, they have different interests. Uh, ultimately, you know, people tend to uh, vote for their own own future, their family's future, and whatnot. I think at the previous election, 2019, I think there is some evidence, for example, that um, in the for example the seats that you mentioned, that um, not just the Chinese community but other ethnic communities um, disproportionately voted against um, negative gearing and dividend imputation, and the reason for that was not because of their ethnic um, uh, background, but because they um, were business people, small business people, franchise operators, you know, running um, 7-Eleven stores, whatever, um, petrol stations, um, many of whom either had or aspired to have a negatively geared investment property. So, um, you know, logically, I guess you'd say, they voted for their, for their interests. Now, um, that's because it made them very similar to lots of other Australians. They didn't. They didn't do that because of their their particular ethnic background. Yes, in other words, they voted on the economy, like most Australians. I think if there were overt attacks on a particular community, that has the force of of uniting the community. So, um, quite often, um, groups that really um, have little real unity only come together when you know when they feel that they're they're being attacked uh, by somebody do you have an example of that uh for well, fortunately in australia not directly no but um you know um we're, i think we're we're lucky like that occasionally there's attempts by people to say well you know such and such a candidate or whatever is anti a particular group um and maybe once in a while that's correct but um there's Fortunately, very little evidence of that sort of behaviour occurring. Now, before I come to you, Rebecca, I'm just going to ask Brian one more question about this, and you may or may not recall this, but in, you, you're very familiar with Canada. In the recent Canadian election, uh, there was an, a Canadian, Chinese-Canadian parliamentarian who lost yes. his seat and blamed yes. it on yes. uh, pro-mainland mm. um, agitators in his electorate. Um, I am familiar with the case, um, and it wasn't just, there was a number of seats and it's happened or allegedly happened in a number of other democratic societies. And I think it's a deeply, deeply concerning and a deeply, deeply worrying development. It's something I know is of concern to, um, to senior security officials um, across a number of nations. Uh, and it is something that's being uh, monitored, I think, pretty carefully. But you don't see evidence of it here or having happened here? Um, I have no doubt at all that at some level uh, there are attempts for it to happen here, but whether it's enough to um, move large blocks, um, I'm, I just don't think, uh, fortunately, I don't think we're at that point. Okay, Rebecca, sorry, you've given this issue some thought. Over to you. Well, it's interesting. I was involved in um, the ABC's Australia Talk survey, both waves of it, and the survey was large enough for us to actually pull out a sample of um, Chinese Australians, so people who were first, second or third generation Chinese Australians. And, of course, we asked many questions that would normally be asked in a poll around things like cost of living, education, climate change. And really, there were not significant differences between what you would describe as the Chinese Australians and non-Chinese Australians, even on issues like climate change. So the, the, the statistical difference, if there was there, was you know either within the margin of error or around it. And so actually there was no story to tell about kind of, you know, it, it, around that issue. I mean, certainly in things like, for example, the data coming out of the same sex marriage survey showed there was a triangulation between occasionally between ethnicity um, 
rate of arrival, so your recent arrival and religion, but that's quite particular and it played itself out in particular it, on a particular issue in particular electorates. Now, whether that can be something that gets activated within a general election where people are, are thinking about larger issues, I think that's really debatable. But what I would say is, um, as somebody who's been involved in campaigns of all kinds, I do think that um, we're not great at tapping into um, local or national ethnic media, particularly social media, and finding a way to actually have these conversations in um, not in English, but with first generation migrants around issues. And when that is done well, <laughs> when that communication can is done well in certain in contexts, then actually you can get you can you can you have a larger share of voice and perhaps potentially more persuasive because it's not often done very well. I mean, obviously we we translate things, and there's obviously been attempts to you know engage with ethnic communities in in electorates where they um um where they might have a larger representation, but we're just not really good at campaigning in 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 not in English in this country, and this is a country where lots of people speak a language other than English. Yes, I'll just give a quick plug to Lowy's work on this. We've actually been funded by the Home Affairs Department. We've done extensive polling at the Chinese Australian, and certainly the polling picked up a greater anxiety in the Chinese community, uh, uh, complaints about greater sort of racial abuse, um, if you like, a sense of being surprising in the current circumstances, but we didn't at all look at voting intentions, so I wouldn't have anything much to say on that. Um, so I'm going to move on, and Tony, I'll try you first on this, and this will just have to be, I guess, an, unless you've looked at it in a polling group recently, but I'll get everybody's opinion on this. Um, as you say, there's, you know, ferment, uncertainty, it's overwhelmed right now by economic uncertainty and sort of the long tail of uh, COVID um, uh, and the like. But over time, both parties are committed to very publicly higher, sustained higher defence spending. And this is going to take place at a time when the budget is going to be under immense pressure. Um, what's your sense of how the community will respond to that? I mean, we can look beyond the current election because this is going to be a long running story. What's your sense about that? Um, in the United States, there's always this battle between the Democrats preserve social security and they give the Republicans the Pentagon budget to put it very crudely. We don't have the similar budgetary process here, but what happens if you know, there's a demand for greater welfare out outlays, education, health, but also defense? Um, how do you see the community playing into that? Um, look, I think most swinging voters would feel reassured to a degree that would understand there needs to be defense spending and it needs to to be there to a you know a, a decent degree um but would it swing votes or lose votes it's almost neutral I, th I think you know I think if if either side got totally carried away um one way or the other then then yes that would become an issue but I don't see it as a massive uh it would I don't see it as gaining massive support and similarly you know I don't see it as as, as, as an issue that would lose tons of supports. It's something that people just think ha has to be there and accept has to be there. Certainly the quality of spending would matter. Um, you know, the submarines comes up in our groups um, a little bit and it just, became, that comes along with, um, you know, spending, you know, misspending on all sorts of different car parks and all sorts of different different things. So if it's not spent well, I think that would that would worry people and that would go to the, you know, the competence of the government. But as an issue in its own right, um, given the present situation and the situation can can change, um, it's it's almost neutral. If the threat was to become more imminent um, and people became more worried, then you know I'd I'm sure they would support, um, you know, greater greater spending. But um, we don't get. I would don't think I, I would get people in groups crying out for greater spending at this point in time. Brian, let me ask you about that. Now, you worked in the past for a Liberal Defence Minister, John Moore. Um, as you say and have said before, you know, national security issues can ramp up quickly, but of course, defence spending uh, decisions are made over decades, uh, effectively. Um, uh, uh, 
what is, you know, and if you look at something like the submarines project, nuclear powered submarines, this is something that almost requires, you know, wartime levels of mobilization of expertise and funds and manufacturing capability and the like to really ramp this up quickly. If that's what we have decided and we have, uh, we need. So how does how does the uh, how do politicians handle this, particularly with uh, uh, you know limited money to spend? Well, I think um, Tony touched on this. Um, there are certain things that um, the community expect their leaders to do. Um, one is manage the economy, and the other is you know manage national security, particularly the defence force. So um, I think defence is in the fortunate position of having a fairly broad consensus of support for an increase in the budget. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so um, I don't think it's a, a particularly controversial issue uh, or, or a politicised issue. The administration of um, defence contracts, of course, has a very long history of becoming controversial, um, but that's a separate thing to whether or not the money in principle should be being spent. Um, I think that... Um, I think we're in a very interesting stage of evolution of the discussion about nuclear power and in particular nuclear submarines. I think that um, the sort of Cold War elements of the debate that motivated the anti-nuclear movement and whatnot uh, have dissipated. And I think um, certainly in the last 10 years or so, I think more and more um, the issues are being considered uh, on their merits as opposed to polemically, um, which I, of course is a good thing. Um, we're not quite at the point yet, I think, of having a, a, a consensus uh, on uh, nuclear, but I think we're moving in that direction, very much so. But you think, though, you don't see a sort of a budgetary tussle. Certainly the Rudd-Gillard government has come under criticism, I think, for putting off some spending in, you know, when things were tight. Well, look, I think... Um, irrespective of who wins the election, there are certain common challenges that are going to remain common um, for, the next, for the next government. And one of those is the management of the budget. Um, the budget um, is projected to have deficits a long time into the future. Um, the, um, and we have aged care, NDIS, and of course, uh, submarines and other defence spending to be factored in. So it's inevitable that there's going to be uh, a bit of a tussle, I guess, about um, uh, who gets what share of the cake and how big the cake is. Should, should there be um, increased taxation of some sort, increased revenue, uh, additional growth, so on and so forth. So um, uh, defence is, uh, I think, in a stronger position going into that um, tussle, that debate, uh, than it has been for quite a long time. Okay, that's a good seed, Rebecca, to an issue I was going to ask you about at the top, and that's nukes to nuclear power to climate change. Um, certainly climate change is now considered, uh, you know, by many around the world as part of, you know, a national security issue. The Pentagon certainly speaks about this uh, quite openly. A Labor government, if elected, has said they would immediately ask uh, the peak intelligence body in Australia, the Office of National Assessments, to, to prepare an assessment of the national security implications of climate change. So bearing that in mind, do you think voters um, see climate change in that context? No, they don't, it, with, one, um, with one caveat, which I'll come to in a minute. And I think there's a re couple of reasons why they perhaps don't see that. If you if you extend the national security frame to talk about borders, some of the projections around the impact of climate change on uh, on not only conflict but on uh, on the increase of refugees and people seeking asylum is quite um, shocking. So there's absolutely no doubt that once uh, borders do open and once those flows happen that we will be getting people in Australia seeking asylum based on climate. And so there are challenges there. And that's well understood by um, uh, policy and uh, academics looking at that work. Um, I mean, there's lots of projections. I mean, there, there have been some, um, uh, you know, effective, particularly not not so much serving now, but previous serving um, 
uh, members of the armed forces that have spoken about the need to address climate change in terms of national security, but that hasn't permeated groups. But where it is beginning to start as a conversation is in the were in the focus groups I do in areas that have been affected uh, directly and and impacted really quite badly by floods and fires in which the in which the army and defence force have been deployed, and we saw certainly in the fires some. Oh, sorry, in the floods, perhaps some kind of unfair criticism of their actions on the ground. And of course, the army, um, the armed forces need to be trained to deploy the work and need to be well equipped to deploy the work that they need to do if they're actually addressing um, internal security and safety and and um, uh, extreme weather uh uh, mitigate, you know, kind of uh, addressing those questions internally. It, it requires a, a, a new, perhaps new equipment, new forms of training, and there's an understanding of that in those communities when they've actually seen what the army can and can't do, particularly what the armed forces can and can't do. It was interesting to me in the previous budget that was um, handed down and lots of discussion around uh, funding of defence that there wasn't any um, funding of that particular um, increasing and no doubt, um, no doubt increasing demand on our defence force to actually deal with what's happening here and actually sit um, and with and you know if you're to believe climate um, scientists, which I imagine most of us do, these are not things that aren't going to not happen in the future. So those conversations in those areas talk about and how that how it manifests itself is well. Nuclear powered submarines are all very well and good, but how are we equipping our armed forces to deal with these kinds of, you know, effectively to deal with the kinds of things that we're dealing with today? Okay, well, I, on that point, uh, this is not something that you may have all covered in, in recent research, but I think it's uh, an issue which is related to that. One of the big issues related to the national security uh, discussion at the moment is the Pacific. Obviously, the climate change is part of that. China is part of that. The US is part of that. And also immigration is part of that. Uh, we have a Pacific worker scheme here. And if Labor is elected, they've copied the New Zealand policy of giving uh, a certain quota each year for uh, Pacific Islanders to actually migrate here, a green card type lottery. Um, Mr. Morrison often talked about the Pacific family and the like. Um, Rebecca, I'll start with you. I mean, do you have a sense, you know, immigration comes up a lot in your focus groups, or it did until it sort of dropped off uh, during uh, COVID. Australia is going to have to forge a much closer, more intimate, uh, dare I say it, more nuanced. I know that word nuanced is out of fashion these days, but more nuanced relationship with uh, uh, the Pacific countries. And that means a greater uh, not just security involvement, but a greater two-way flow of people, and perhaps many more than that if uh, the, the waters do in fact rise. What's your sense of Australians' view of the Pacific? Are we welcoming of that? I think in theory, if it's raised and prompted, but it comes out very rarely in focus groups. Um, and I think part of that might be a general reticence about the idea that Australia can whether we've got the ability to lead in the area people would want us to but they don't quite know what that looks like i think the understanding that perhaps where um the increasing ambition of china in the area in in that area and our role played there and our, our um, relationship there is also not particularly well understood it doesn't really live in all the things that make people anxious about um, uh, China's global reach, it doesn't always come up, except in, in highly educated, highly engaged groups. Um, there is, I think, increasing understanding about the impact of climate change in the Pacific and perhaps our, um, potentially our kind of glib response to that. <laughs> um, but I think, again, the idea that we might actually have um, people seeking, uh, you know, refugee status as as, as um, climate refugees as a, as a consequence of that is also not particularly well understood. I mean, I think we've only got a, a, an emerging understanding that parts of Australia in the Torres Strait um, are threatened by climate change. We might have to have um, climate refugees who are in their own country. So I don't think it's a, 
I would like to think it's an emerging conversation that's being had, but it really isn't. And if it's ever brought up, it, it tends to be somebody who reads The Guardian a lot. <laughs> Not necessarily somebody I always have as a swinging voter in a marginal seat in my groups, but I might only be, I might be getting a particular, oh, Tony, do you get people that talk? Well, I, I was thinking more to, more about the immigration thing and, and, and look, I think immigration is interesting at the moment um, because, and Rebecca touched on this before, but people are aware that there are shortages um, and it's particularly in service industries. The awareness of that, it's huge. So where it's needed, I think um, people are going to welcome uh, immigration, particularly at, at the moment. But it's interesting. I think it'll always be at least... For the, in the short term, um, a, a certainly a fraught issue. And you can just tell in the language of both sides when they talk about immigration, um, they both talk about skilled immigration. Um, they never just talk about immigration. We need more skilled immigration um, or immigration in a particular certain area where we've got a shortage here. So they're aware that it, it, it is a, it is a, um, a fraught issue and, and the Labor Party, you know, just today goes even further on that and says, you know, not at the expense of apprentices and, and we need to also put money into apprentices. So it remains a fraught issue. Brian, what about just to, from you finally on the issue of the Pacific and closer relationships uh, across the board? Um, have you given that issue any thought? Well, I think uh, the community uh, understands that, you know, this is our patch. Now, uh, we have legitimate interests and legitimate responsibilities in this area. Now, is it the sort of thing that's top of mind with people? No, no, it's not. But I think that there is plenty of scope for you know, national leadership in this area because um, uh, to go back to where we started the conversation, there is uh, increasing concern about developments in the region um, and um, a realisation that if um, the rise of China is going to be, or the changed approach of China is going to be matched, um, Australia will have to play its part, play its role. And I think there's you know, a strong um, legacy from um, in many families in the community from the Second World War, where um, many, many people uh, served in the area. Um, so I, I think that there's a, there's a strong residual um, I think uh, goodwill, um, but also a sense and a recognition that given the times we're in, that Australia does have a role to play in and really um, has a responsibility. And on that slightly more positive note, uh, we'll bring to a close this event on uh, national security and the federal election. I'd like to thank Rebecca Huntley, Tony Mitchell Moore and Brian Lochnane for their time. And while we're talking about the Pacific, Later on this afternoon, my uh, Pacific Island Program Director colleague, Jonathan Pryke, will be hosting an event on the Solomon Islands, also hosted uh, on YouTube. Thank you very much. <laughs>